Welcome to Bright Divinity's School Borderlands Institute Fall Webinar Series on the theme of responsibility and immigration. My name is Francisco Lozada and I teach at Bright Divinity School and I'm also the director of the Borderlands Institute at Bright. We are very excited about this series and especially grateful to the Henry Luce Foundation for Theology for making this event possible. I would like to add that all webinar events are recorded and you can find them on Bright's YouTube page. In short, the series aims to bring awareness to the very complex issues around immigration and make a modest contribution to adding voice to the voiceless and providing new narratives to various issues such as xenophobia, sexuality, the climate, ethics, and children and migration which we will hear about today. Our distinguished presenter today is Professor Iracema Coronado, who's the director of the School of Transborder Studies at Arizona State University. She is co-author of the book entitled Fronteras No Mas, for social justice at the US-Mexico border and Politicas Latina public officials in Texas. In 2000, 2006, she served as the president of the Association of Borderlands Studies. Hispanic Business Magazine named her one of the top 100 influential Hispanics in the U.S. in October of 2010, and she serves on the Ms. Magazine Academic Advisory Board and is co-chair of the Coalition Against Violence Toward Women and Families on the U.S.-Mexico Border. Her present research includes women in politics, environmental cooperation, U.S.-Mexico border politics, and the impact of the deportation process on families and children, as you know through her paper. On a personal note, Professor Coronado and I have known each other for over 20 years. We've also taken many students to the borderlands of El Paso, Texas, and Nogales, Arizona, and spoken to many scholars, activists, and migrants, migrants themselves. We've also listened to and spoken with various immigration officials over the years. Today's presentation is entitled Children Crisscrossing Borders in the Americas. As the, pre as the presentation begins, feel free to begin submitting questions in the chat room. You can also introduce yourself, tell us where you're from. We will try our best at the end of the presentation to address uh, your questions. So without further ado, join me with a virtual clap in welcoming <laughs> Professor Coronado. The stage is yours, Irasa. Thank you. Buenos dias, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Before I begin, I would like to thank my dear friend, Francisco. And I think, Francisco, we've known each other for over almost 30 years, actually. Oh, it's been a while. Uh, but thank you very much for inviting me to share a little bit of my, my research with this group today. I'm very happy to be here. And I also would like to take Clayton for his help in bringing this um, event to fruition. You know, the technical people behind the scenes make this happen. And I'm truly appreciative of their efforts because without them, this would not happen. So in the Americas, we have witnessed unprecedented human mobility. According to UNICEF, uh, 6.3 million migrant children in the Americas face life-threatening situations and multiple forms of violence. In 2019, over 30,000 children were returned to El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras from the United States and Mexico. In 2015, 100,000 unaccompanied and separated children were apprehended at the U.S.-Mexico border. This is um, un untenable for us because, uh, as I will share with you, my co-editor and I decided that it was time to bring awareness to the human mobility of children throughout the Americas. And so my friend and colleague, Alejandra Jazrowitz, and I uh, called out to our friends who are working in this area, and we now have a co-edited book that is in the hands of the University of Arizona Press. It will be published in 2022. We're very excited because this really covers um, a lot of the issues uh, regarding the migration of children. So a shout out to Alejandra for her leadership on this project. And um, I'm going to go ahead and begin. So I am with the School of Transborder Studies, and I do want you to know that all of you here have a home. 
aquí tienen su casa. The School of Transborder Studies is a very special place at Arizona State University. We have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD in Transborder Studies. So we're always recruiting students and we'd welcome you to look at our website and hopefully you would consider coming here and applying for our programs. So the goal of our book project wasn't really just to write a book that was academic, that was going to review the literature, that was going to highlight the problem, because we already know that children are migrating and they face horrendous, horrendous hardships. So what we wanted to do was to provide within this context a toolbox, a toolkit for those who work with children on the borders. And we also wanted to examine how media, literature, legislation, public policies, and everyday practices construct and deconstruct migrant childhoods. And so we wanted to help educators, social workers, policymakers, and advocates uh, to, uh, who accompanied immigrant children in their journeys of self-recognition, their search for empowerment, and their struggles for rights and citizenship. One of the common themes that we know of uh, children migrating and their experiences is that they want to belong. They want to be a part of something. They, want, they don't want to be the other. And this is something that's very important. So our theoretical background for the book is de intersectionality and decolonialism. And in the introduction, we basically state that the identities of immigrant and refugee children go beyond dichotomic hierarchical conceptions. They juxtapose questions of race, gender, class, citizenship, and geopolitics. Um, we have collaborators from, through, from the Americas, from Canada, from Latin America, from the US. And one of the things that Alejandra and I concluded as if our book could speak, one would say that our book has a variety of accents because we have Portuguese speakers, French speakers, Spanish speakers, English speakers, and many people wrote the papers in their, in their native language and then they were translated. And so it, it really has been an, an inordinate amount of work, but it's been very pleasurable because otherwise we wouldn't get to hear the stories of other people from other perspectives. So that's why we're very happy. So we do say our, our book has an accent. Um, so part one of the book uh, is basically educational experiences on borders. And uh, the first chapter is children of returned migrants crossing the linguistic and cultural border in Mexico, United States. And basically Kathleen Tesselowski in this chapter looks at US citizen children who are now living in Mexico, whose parents were deported. And they talk about how they feel having gone to school in Los Angeles, having gone to school in Houston, having gone to school in uh, Tucson, how they now feel going to school in Oaxaca, how they miss their U.S. classroom, how they miss speaking English, how it's difficult for them to learn Spanish, and how the other children exclude them and tr treat them and call them gringos. You're not like us. You're a gringo. You're Americanized or a gringa. And so that, that's something that Kathleen brings to the table. Um, the, the second chapter in this section is uh, by a teacher in Louisiana who teaches with uh, children who are learning English. They're mostly in middle school and high school. And she shares with them, she shares with us some, some experiences that she's had with them in the classroom. The other uh, contributor here is mobility, racism, and cultural borders, immigrant and return children from the United States in the schools of Oaxaca, Mexico. So it's pretty similar to Kathleen's chapter. Um, part two is um, a book on civil rights pedagogy on children on borders, and it's by Alejandra Joshowitz, uh, The Search to Belong in Latin America and Latinx Children's and Young Adult Literature. Um, Elizabeth Valle and Nancy Bouchard are from Canada, and they share with us an experience they had with a middle class school, um, and they're infusing immigration and border studies into the curriculum through art, which is very interesting. Uh, Valentina's chapter deals with, if they catch me today, I'll come back tomorrow. And this is about young border crossers in, in Nogales, Sonora. It's a very, very um, 
a profound chapter. Uh, part three is focused on the best interest of the child's crossing borders. And basically, we're looking at the UN principle of the best interest of the child. As you know, the United States has not ratified that treaty. But we're talking about um, family reunification and childhoods. Is Brazil guaranteeing the best interest of refugee children by Patricia Nabucco Martuccelli? Um, Lena Caswell and Emily have a very interesting um, chapter because they served as legal advocates in a detention center. So their experience is very focused, very profound. And then my chapter, which you you have seen, uh, was uh, you know so far yet so close and yet so far the the children of deportees in Mexico. And then the concluding chapter is by Maria Inés Pacheca, who talks about the Bolivian children migrating to um, Argentina. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the chapters. So uh, Kathleen's chapter talks about social and linguistic issues in Mexican schools. She talks about borders as historical and cultural constructions. And she basically uh, focuses on the processing of crossing back. But it's interesting because it's not crossing back because many of these children have never been in Mexico. Their parents um, were in the United States. The children were born in the United States. But because of the deportation and the goal that the families had to maintain the integrity of the family and maintain the family unified, they took the children with them. And so this is a very interesting experience. Um, it's hard for the children, but she does emphasize the resilience that these children have. Um, Marisa Bejarano Fernba provides um, a lot of very practical tips on how to deal with children in the classrooms and try to make them feel that they belong. And so the first thing she says, you know, don't label migrant children as others. Um, she encourages children to build their futures. One of the things she writes about is don't look back, but look forward. Now that you're here, what does your future look like so that you can then start to prepare academically to join the workforce, to pursue higher education? Um, she also talks about the importance of recognizing and addressing trauma because some of these children have witnessed an inordinate amount of violence. And that's why they have fled. So she talks about uh, having conversations with students who will uh, very naturally say, well, we left because they killed my father. We left because they murdered my uncle. They, we left because my sister was, um, was raped. And so she says they speak about this violence in such a natural way. She said it's very, very traumatic for them because privately then they really have a lot of hurt and a lot of trauma that needs to be addressed. And she talks about you know identifying common challenges in the classrooms for migrant children, learning English, uh, the right academic tools that they need in order to be successful. Um, Martinez talks about the exclusion and cultural racism in school, and she talks about the challenges about being in a country where they did not grow up. Uh, she talks about identity struggles, uh, internalize, internalize, interna, internalizing Mexican culture, and then the issue of language and how some teachers in Mexican schools are not prepared to work with students that don't speak Spanish. It's kind of interesting, right? The difference between these chapters and, and, and for example, this particular chapter and Marisa Bejarano Fernbus chapter. Um, Alejandra looks at children's book by, by Gloria Ansaldúa. And when I first read Alejandra's chapter, I was not familiar with the work of Gloria Ansaldúa uh, in children's books. I, I, I thought that she only wrote for you know, the academic world that she only wrote for uh, maybe young adults, but really she has some children's books that are very interesting. And she also questions how the literature, you know, questions stereotypes about children. Um, and she provides uh, literature as a tool for fighting racism and xenophobia. And she basically tries to teach empathy about migration and migrant children focusing on resilience through literature, which is a very powerful way to engage children with these topics. Uh, this also aligns with Elizabeth and Nancy's work looking at um, non-immigrant children's understanding of ethics and global literacy. 
and how basically they mobilize children's literature and art to develop literacy in a global culture, to promote global education, and to construct um, learning within a border perspective. So this was a very interesting, and this, this study took place in Montreal, in Quebec. Um, this work by Valentina is one of the most, I would say, painful chapters because these are children that are in a Mexican government-sponsored detention facility in Nogales, Sonora. And they basically have been used by smugglers, by drug dealers. Many of them have crossed many times back and forth. They have been caught, they have been deported, they go back. Um, and basically, she, she, they, they asked the children through art to express their experiences and to think about migration uh, and their process with the migration system through discussion and through writing. And they, they, they detail how borderization regimes produce social as well as individual suffering. Uh, and this is very, it's a very hard chapter to read. But she also just uses the border as method to destabilize how borders produce children and children produce borders. So it's a very fascinating article. Uh, and then we do have images of, of, of some of the artwork that the students made. Uh, hopefully, you know, now that we're going through the process of reviewing the, uh, the book, uh, some, of, some of these images might not make it, but we're hoping that they will because they really share a big story. Um, Patricia's book looks at relevant Brazilian legislation and policy on family reunification. She interviews uh, government uh, officials as well as civil society activists that work in this. And she basically says, yes, the best interest of the child is embodied in law, but it's not reflected in policy. And she argues that the human rights of children are being consistently violated and that you need a better policy that truly reflects the best interest of the child. And you, right now, Brazil is dealing with a lot of children from Venezuela. And that's, that's one of the challenges that they have. Um, uh, Lina Caswell and Emily Ruz Navarro, uh, really one of the things that struck me about their chapter was, you know, first they, they were volunteering in the detention center as legal advocates and how they were able to really learn the stories of children. They also discuss the limitations of interacting with the children. So for example, one of the first rules is no touching. So if you feel that a child would benefit from holding their hand or from giving them a hug, you have to refrain from that because it's just not allowed. And I'm sure there's a good reason for that, but at the same time, you know, a, a hug and a, the human touch can be healing, right? And so they talk a lot about the structural violence that is at work in the child detention facilities in the United States. Uh, they shed light on the ethical dilemmas and the trauma that children and advocates face, because sometimes you're working with the child uh, for two or three weeks, and then the child is no longer there and there is no explanation and there is no point of contact. You can't follow up and say, let me continue working with this young man or let me continue working with this young woman um, because I'm sorry, with, with these children, because it's just not allowed. And so you're like, she says, you always wonder, they both argue, whatever happened, you know, what is their future going to be like? And that's something that they, um, they felt was um, very painful for them. And then she also talked about other advocates needing to have a deep understanding of the structural violence that these children endure. Um, my chapter is also based on the best interest of the child principle as a set of ethical standards. And I would argue that Mexico and the United States have overlooked the best interest of the child principle. I conducted a lot of interviews with families in Ciudad Juarez, in Nogales, and in Tijuana. And basically, the, the separation, the deportation, and legal status and citizenship for children who are at the margins of two nations. Um, I met a, a woman who has um, two children, U.S. citizens, that live in Mexico. And she's like, why can't my children cross the border and go to U.S. schools? They're U.S. citizens. They're going to go to the United States eventually. So why not give them the opportunity to grow up partly in their country, right? So it's a very interesting dynamic here, what happens with the deportations. And um, the deportation process can be 
very traumatic for children. Just yesterday, my colleague Eileen Diaz McConnell was sharing with me some data from Pew. And she says, still, in spite of the pandemic, in spite of all the things that are happening among, um, uh, among Latinos in the United States, fear of deportation still ranks among one of the highest worries and concerns that people have. Um, so it's, it's something that she's going to be working on with a colleague on a paper on that. Um, working in Argentina, the Bolivian children in garment workshops and vegetable farms, stores, and domestic work. Um, she looks at the foundational studies on migrant child workers, which is a global phenomena, and she looks at the insights of uh, children's independent migration outside of parental context, that a lot of children on their own volition leave their families and say, I am going to go to work, either because they don't want to be a burden to their family or they feel that through work they can then um, bring back, um, you know, resources for their family. And she talks about how childhood is characterized for Bolivian migrant children in Argentina. There's certain racism and exclusion that goes on there. And she basically draws attention to the exploitation of child workers and how their families view their presence in the workforce. Um, I'm very interested in sh talking a little more about the chapters and talking more about my own work. Uh, and I know we have plenty of time for questions and answers. I, I timed it. I thought I had more time, but this is exciting to be able to, to engage with you in conversation. So thank you. Um, we do have a few here, and uh, and uh, if, um, I also have some questions myself. If, uh, but I will we'll address the audience's questions first. If, um, but there's the first question had had to do with um, uh, just the. I think we could post this on my website. Here is the title of the book, um, and where one could publish that. Uh, there was a question regarding to uh, um, work. What can they put? Uh, 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 Public, uh, purchase the book, the title of the book. Yeah. Okay, so so the title of the book is Children Crisscrossing Borders in the Americas. The University of Arizona Press is going to be publishing it in 22. So it's not quite ready. Uh, we're in the works. We're, we're getting now some feedback and it's being edited and, you know, all the copyright things with the pictures and things that we're doing. So hopefully by 22, we'll be able to... Um, you know, have a copy of these books in every library and in every every household. Mm -hmm. Good. There's there's a, another question um, that pertains to um, Mexican parents who uh, raise their children. Are are there Mexican parents raising their children to be bilingual? Oh yes, yeah. yes. You know, it, it's it's interesting that many Mexican parents rely on their children to be their interpreters and their translators. And I have seen children who are 10, 12 years old accompany a parent to a bank or to a medical office or to um, some service, you know, the water bill or whatever, you have an issue. And the children are helping to negotiate this transaction and it's hard. It's hard for children, especially when it's something private, because it brings them into an adult conversation that maybe the parents can't pay the water bill and they're asking for an extension, or the mother is going for a medical checkup and there's a problem, and the child is the person that delivers the bad news to the mom. I mean, this is inappropriate. That's why I really believe and advocate for interpreters and translators at the professional level to help with these transactions. But no, a lot of families do raise their children to be bilingual because it's added value to to the country, to the world, to be a, a speaker of other languages. Mm -hmm. okay. But I think for them, it's, it's a practical necessity to um, have someone who can interpret for you and who can tell you what's going on. There's a question with regard to, um, could you speak to the way that classroom teachers, and I would add there even um, uh, ministers or religious leaders, might benefit from some of the suggested approaches um, in these chapters? Um, 
teachers and other uh, community leaders often want to advocate but feel overwhelmed by policy, but they have the power to affect children powerfully in the classrooms and through family outreach. Um, the person would like to hear your comments on, on this question. Okay, so the first thing that I tell everyone who wants to address these issues and to fix the world like we all do, I, I'm gonna share a little story with you. Um, there, there, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Brazilian fable, it's a, Philippi, it's a Brazilian story, and it goes like this, the, the jungle is on fire. You know, this whole thing is on fire and the animals are running for their lives. Uh, and the lion and the hummingbird are running in tandem and the hummingbird keeps coming and going, coming and going. And the lion says, hummingbird, what are you doing? And the hummingbird says, I am going to get water to put out this huge fire. And the lion says, how much water can you possibly carry in your little beak? And he said, hey, I'm doing my part. And so sometimes with, with uh, teachers, with uh, religious leaders, with activists, with anyone who wants to be um, an advocate and who wants to help people, it's overwhelming. So you really need to find the niche, the parameter, what you're comfortable doing to help people. And so in the classroom, some of the strategies that some of the authors contribute is first of all, acknowledge the trauma and you might not be equipped to deal with the psychological impact of that, but try to find resources. Because if someone has witnessed their parents being assaulted or their father being murdered or their mother being extorted, it's traumatic. And so how can you think about doing well in a geometry geometry class or a science class when you have these images in your mind. So how can you deal with the trauma? And some of the teachers basically say, you know, this is overwhelming, you know, the, the traumatic experiences that these children have had, what kind of resources do we have? Is the, is the, can we provide psychological services? Are these people trained in dealing with this kind of trauma? And are they bilingual? Can they help the child in their, in their language and in a way that can help them? So I think that's one. Another one is uh, like there's a strategy that uh, Marisa shared that she takes the children who are learning Spanish and she partners them with these immigrant kids who are learning English and they have conversations. And so it kind of creates this, this ambiance of I'm trying to learn your language too. And that that has been a very useful and fruitful experience and that the people, the, the young students wanting to learn English, develop a, a better understanding, appreciation, and respect for the children that only speak Spanish. And so that's another strategy. Um, other people feel that classrooms don't have enough resources and that they are not equipped to deal with the kinds of things they need. And so it's very uh, challenging to uh, get school districts sometimes to um, send people to training, to buy more resources, to uh, have um, consultants come in and say, you know, how can we better help, you know, integrate these children into our educational systems? And I think, you know, religious leaders can do a lot by creating activities that include everyone. Uh, I think one of the things I've learned about working with immigrant families is that it's very hard sometimes to just take one child like, oh, this is only for the seventh grader, or this is only for the ninth grader. And they like to do multi-generational activities so that no one feels excluded. Another thing that um, is an issue is transportation, because some of these uh, families live in very precarious economic situations, and so they budget their gas money for the week. And so if this entails an extra trip to go either to the church or to uh, the school, it compromises their budget and their gas money to be able to then get to work like on Friday before they get paid. So those are the kinds of things that we need to take into account. How can we integrate everyone? How can we help families be, feel that they belong? I think that the, the theme of belonging is a major responsibility for all of us. How can we make feel 
make people feel that they too belong and that they need to be included in, in our society. The, the, there's a couple of questions that you've already addressed somewhat. The question of trauma, Henry from Iowa addresses the question of trauma, which you've uh, sort of uh, touched upon a little bit. And I would add there um, uh, some of the work that Mark Lusk does at uh, UTEP, um, this, this phenomenal work on trauma um, and what migrants go through um, on the various stages. And then there's also a question about getting a copy of um, uh, Marisa's essay. I, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that's something um, we can oh, do. Sure. Uh, uh, sure. Maybe uh, publish it on the um, uh, or uh, connect it to um, my um, my webpage where I have sure. resources there. Yeah. So uh, as, as long as we put the disclaimer, because this is part of the book. Sure, sure. <laughs> but definitely, yeah, for sure, right. we can make that happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there's also a question about links to to trainings, um, suggestions on training for for this sort of thing. Um, where where the religious um, social leaders, community leaders, might be able to to um, get some training on this, um, I, you know. Um, so there's some references. Uh, a question along those lines. Um, I, I might add is there, have you has your research seen a difference between uh, children in the urban setting vis-a-vis -vis the rural setting? I'm not sure if that makes sense there. Um, well, like, for example, in Los Angeles, that school district deals with children from all over the world. I believe in the uh, Los Angeles Unified School District, there are over 128 languages represented. Mm -hmm. Not that all the students speak the language, but they come from household. They speak Farsi, Japanese, uh, Spanish, Quechua. I mean, there's there's a lot uh, of you know linguistic diversity, right? And so they have experience. But when you go to a small rural community where, you know, this is a new phenomena, you're getting refugee children, you're not used to integrating them into the classroom. The teacher's not used to dealing with uh, kids that don't speak Spanish. Uh, some school districts are are buying um, these translating gadgets that you speak and then it appears or you you know that that kind of thing I mean is that a good pedagogical tool we don't have enough research on that and we don't know uh, but you know some people do try and other people they just basically exclude the child the language that when parents come to register the children to go to school you know they don't have someone who speaks Spanish um, they don't have Marisa talks about that in, in rural Louisiana that um, the the registrar just i'm like okay there's families here i don't understand i need someone to come here and speak spanish and sometimes the parents because they have to go to work or they took just an hour off of work can't wait and then they leave and she said sometimes these families don't come back and so how can we provide you know infrastructure of support at the onset but this takes time resources and money and i think that you know I, I, do i have a link where you can go to workshops no the, these are things that I think we need to say, this is a need, how can we maybe have a conference and everyone share a best practice and then try to put a toolkit together so that people can help and then do an inventory of community resources. Do you have people that are retired that maybe can help tutor these kids to improve their English and help? Maybe they're Spanish speakers and they can be translators and interpreters. You know, there's a lot of ways that we can basically help people um, help themselves, right? Um, and trying to be a resource, you know, how can we be a resource? And sometimes it can be overwhelming to provide because some, like some of these children have incredible needs, whether it's migration, uh, you know, legal assistance, food shortages in their homes, they don't have money to pay the electricity, um, a family member has fallen ill who is the breadwinner, uh, the car has broken down, things can be complicated. And one of the things that you know, newly arrived immigrants do not have is access to credit. And so everything is cash based. And if you have, you know, a little money, but your tire is flat and you need to buy a new one, that could be, you know, your food money for the week. And then what do you do, right? So the needs are great. And so we need to be sensitive to, you know, how can I help you? Uh, what, what, are, what are the needs? And not assume, because sometimes you just don't know, right? 
I don't know if I answered that question, but it's, it's, this is complicated. And at the end of the day, it's not like, oh, we have this wonderful story to share. No, this is painful. And this is one of the things why we wrote this book is how do we ameliorate this human suffering? Has the, has the current situation with the Haitians and the Haitian children, have that, um, has it brought new issues, new insights? Um, what's, is there anything you can share along those lines? Well, I mean, because of Title 42, you know, the health uh, issues that, you know, we do not allow people who can be a health risk into the country. They're just, you know, the U.S. feels justified in, in, in doing that. This is not the first time that Haitians show up at the border. There are now communities of Haitians in Tijuana. Tijuana had an influx of Haitians about maybe six years ago. Uh, you know, Haiti always has either an earthquake, a, you know, political instability, uh, hurricanes. And so there's now a Haitian community in Tijuana that's pretty vibrant. They have restaurants, they have, you know, services, they're integrated, they're working. Many of them have learned Spanish. And so that does exist. And I think people were you know, 14,000 people, that is a lot of people. And so how do you address these problems at, at the at the source rather than, you know, here on the border? And that's people, people were very concerned about that. You know, what do we do with all these people? You know, and, and can they get asylum? And can they get refugee status? You know, it's, it's complicated. Um, just looking through the questions here. Um, let's see lost my way here. Um, so, so one solution that I have offered to many people who hopefully will listen, mm -hmm. especially when it involves Central American migration, why does the United States government not open up a special office in their embassy in San Salvador, in Tegucigalpa, in Guatemala City, and interview people requesting asylum there. And basically, you know, provide, do the credible fear interview, provide the documentation of the reason why I need to leave my country is fear of gangs, fear of the military, fear of the drug dealers, fear of the police, a fear of the people who are extorting me or because I have suffered this violence or because my daughter is being threatened or because the drug dealers and the gangs are after my sons. And you present your case there. And if you then meet the standard, then you're granted asylum, you're given safe passage to the United States and you move on. Because some of the trauma and the hardship and the heartache is the trek from Central America through Mexico to the border. People suffer dehydration, animal bites, they're robbed. Some of them are sexually assaulted. Some of them are kidnapped. Some of them lose their way. Um, the, the smuggler left them or the group they were with you know, they had to stay behind because they couldn't keep up. They lose their way. Um, they go hungry. So why do we uh, put people through this human suffering, right, only to be, um, to arrive at the border and be told you have to wait because of the um, migrant protection protocols that are in place? And, you know, very few people end up getting asylum. This is not something that the United States government, you know, gives freely. You have to really make a good case. And so what's happening to many asylum seekers is that they're then being turned away. So right now, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees is setting up offices in, in, in different border cities, in Juarez, and they have a, a very large operation. And basically, they're asking these Central Americans, these um, other migrants from Venezuela, from Cuba. So the American dream is not a reality. It's not going to happen. You're now here in Mexico. What do you want to do? 
And the United Nations is basically saying, okay, do you want to go back to El Salvador? We will help you find a way to get back that's safe and secure. So they find, you know, bus transportation, they find shelters that will house them along the way so that people can get home safely. And others that have made up their mind and request asylum in Mexico are then provided with resources. Okay, here's how you enroll your children in school. This is how you get a job. This is how what the documents you will need to be able to, to stay here. And here's where you can possibly work. And so that is happening because right now on the U.S.-Mexico border, there is a humanitarian crisis of inordinate magnitude with thousands of people waiting either for their credible fear interview or to um, to be to be returned or to stay. I mean, they, they don't have much of a choice, right? So how do we mitigate that? Many of them are living in tent cities. Many of them are living in shelters that are overwhelmed and overrun. In the middle of this pandemic, it's not a good situation for anybody. So why can't the U.S. government have an office in the country of origin that will start to at least vet and review these asylum petitions because many people also sell everything, the house, the furniture, everything, only to pay that money to a smuggler that will attempt to bring them to the United States. And, and sometimes they're caught, sometimes they are um, robbed, sometimes the smuggler abandons them and then what, right? So we can mitigate this human suffering by taking some action. Uh, and our government, I think, can do a lot better, in my humble opinion. Yeah. I think you're touching upon some of the, the theme of this webinar series in, in the sense of the responsibility that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think what we often hear, and I've heard it in the classroom as well as in the public arena, is, well, you know, our responsibility stops on the notion that these are not citizens. Mm -hmm. And as of course, as a theologian, I would always respond, but these are these are God's children. Exactly. And so mm -hmm. it's uh, so I frame a lot of my classroom around that. Um, mm -hmm. it, and so it's 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 a it's a challenge. It's a challenge to convince uh, people um, that we do have a responsibility, whether whether they you know whether you you are Christian or not, uh, whether you are a citizen or not. That is, um, so, you know, or at least theologically, God sees no borders. Exactly. Um, so it's, um, but anyway, it, it's, uh, uh, could you, could, is there anything that you can share a little bit more on the, on that responsibility that you see from of your course. years of experience? Yeah. We all need to look at uh, U.S. foreign policy and the history of U.S. intervention in Latin America. We need to look at the impact of globalization we need to look at the impact of colonialism and imperialism in these countries. Um, you know, you have countries like Guatemala, El Salvador, where the United States has intervened in their governments militarily, has destabilized their countries only to make it right for U.S. business interest. United fruit. You know, what do we get from Guatemala? Pineapple, bananas, and coffee. Right. And how can they exporting those three major, you know, items that we we all benefit from? How can they then import computers and cars and technology? It, it just doesn't make sense. The balance of trade is unequal. It's unfair. And how do we then rectify those egregious mistakes of the past? You know, United Fruit they're millionaires because they, you know, the U.S. government intervened. You know, uh, the Dulles brothers were in the CIA and the State Department at the same time, and they made conditions in Guatemala conducive to their business interest and not, not to the people of Guatemala. So we're we're reaping that um, injustice, and so people want a, a better life for their children. They want a better life for themselves. They don't want to live in fear. Every migrant family that I have met, that I have interviewed, when you say, why did you leave? The response is universal, el miedo. I am afraid. And when you ask them what they're afraid of, the military, the drug dealers, the gangs, the local police, they're afraid. 
And so how do we then rectify all of that? How do we help these countries develop institutions, rule of law, economic justice, you know, and, and coupled with climate change now, there are a lot of climate refugees that are now coming to our border because they, they don't have the wherewithal to be able to grow uh, enough food to feed their families, to sell, to trade, and to be a part of this global market. And everyone wants the same. You know, I mean, what what I want for my children, um, I, I want for everybody's children, right? And how do we get people to think that way? You know, why is it that we feel that some children, and this is this goes back to the 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 chapter on on the Bolivian children. The Bolivian children are seen as less than; they're not seen as equal to Argentinian children um, in that society. So, how do we change that? For for some of our audience, can you say a little bit more on why 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 might that be the case? Colorism, uh, Bolivians are more indigenous, Argentinians are more Europeans, um, the othering, right? So there, there's racism, you know, and, and basically that people of darker skin are, are, are not as good as others. Um, I mean, that's common here in the United States too. And, uh, and how do we change that? How do we address the root cause of racism and, and xenophobia and, and colorism in, in, in our societies? There was a question earlier that referred to, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to get it right, but it's, it's, it had to do with gender. Mm -hmm. um, that is, have you seen, has your research seen a difference between uh, male children, female children, as well as uh, have you come across uh, along the lines of transgender children or or children um, with a different um, a different um, sexuality formation um, in your research. Has any of that popped up? Yes, there is some research that Eva Moya is doing on transgendered migrants. Uh, uh, she's at the University of Texas at El Paso. She has done that work. But let me take a little step back. Mm -hmm. There was a belief among asylum seekers that if a father migrated with his daughter and sought asylum, that their chances would be better because the U.S. detention facilities did not have the resources to house a father with a daughter mm. and vice versa. They would say, mothers, don't come with your daughters, bring your son who's mm. 14. And so the, the shelters and, and the detention facilities are not comfortable housing a mother with her 14 year old son when you have a lot of mothers and children. So that there was that belief, right? So that started to happen. And, um, you know, some of the, um, the migrants, like, for example, in the, in the chapter that deals with the, the Nogales Sonora mm -hmm. uh, children that are in the Mexican government shelter right now, um, most of them are, are young men, and some of the young women that are there, they have been victims of violence, sexual assault. It's horrible, and, and, and the pain is palpable uh, that, that is described in that chapter. Um, but there is a difference, uh, and, you know, some, some children um, that, you know, have, uh, you know, gender, you know, they're, they're, they're thinking about this, they're having thoughts, they're having... Uh, questions or they're questioning their identity. Uh, some of them are usually older and, and they are finding some resources. There is some support in some shelters for transgendered youth, uh, but it's not as common as it as it should be to address this issue. Okay. Um, I have a, a question um, and this sparks on some of the readings I've been doing. I've been actually reading a little bit from uh, the Catholic Church's um, documents on immigration from the late 1800s to the present. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I noticed in some of the early part of the, the Catholic tradition, it was that they, those people who are migrating from Europe also migrated with the priests along with them. And, and, and I, you know, my response today is why doesn't the Catholic church do any of that or other Protestant denominations mm -hmm. as well? Because they're not all Catholic. Exactly. Um, have you come across on the other side of on the borderlands of Mexico, are there religious organizations who are ministering to to various Protestant denominations or even Jewish uh, migrants? If there might be some, or or 
along those lines. Have, have you seen any of that? Well, the most recent, um, this was interesting. Mexico gave asylum to Afghani Afghanis that all worked for the New York Times. Mm. And when the Afghanis arrived in Mexico City, the Mexican minister, Marcelo Ebrard, gave a very warm welcome. Mexico is your home. We welcome you here. What can we do to help you? We are excited that, you know, we have an opportunity to, to partner with you in this experience. And that caused a lot of uh, backlash from Central Americans saying, why are they welcoming the Afghanis mm -hmm. and not, not us, right? Because mm -hmm. we're in the same boat, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and they did take into account, you know, religious uh, differences, you know, with the food, with the welcoming, because that, that is the appropriate and the correct thing to do. And so there is that. There are throughout Mexico and Central America many Catholic shelters, and these are called Casas del Migrante. It's a network. And basically this network is, so you're leaving Chiapas and you're going through Guanajuato and you're going through Nogales. And so the, 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 the Casas del Migrante help you and kind of network you. And also they're helping people that are going back saying, you know, I, I can't, I, I, this situation here on the border is not going to work for me. I'm going to go back. And so basically, they're also rendering aid. They render first aid, they render, you know, sh showers, um, food, uh, and spiritual guidance. That's one of the things that they, they do embrace. There are other religious organizations, some Protestant denominations that also have shelters, that also have, um, you know, support services. And there's a lot of partnering. There are a lot of Lutheran churches, a lot of Protestant churches that provide help to the Catholic institution. So there's a lot of uh, interaction between religious organizations. I have not seen any Jewish organizations. I know that in Durango, uh, the largest mosque exists in Durango and in, 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 in uh, the state of Durango, but I don't know what the, the number of mm -hmm. you know, Muslims in Mexico or migrants uh, that are coming through. That would be an interesting study. Have, have you seen a change of the customs border um, uh, Border Patrol um, under the new administration, or is it pretty much, are they still quite pliant to the previous policies? You know, it takes a while because, you know, we've been, you know, we've met with Border yeah. Patrol agents on our trips. Yeah. And I yeah. remember very vividly uh, one agent, actually she was a, a, a female. Right, and right. and remember, I remember she said, under the Obama administration, our hands were tied. We couldn't do our job. Now with the Trump administration, we can do our job. We can detain people. We can send them back. We can, you know, deter them from entering. It's like they felt emboldened, right? So I think it's going to take a while for them to deprogram from that. But because of the migrant protection protocol or the, re the stay in Mexico policy and this uh, Title 42, the health measures that they're taking to not allow people in who might, you know, be sick. Um, that's basically letting them off the hook and, and they're not dealing with that. And you saw, I mean, everyone saw the, um, the terrible images from Del Rio with the um, Border Patrol agents uh, on horseback deterring the, the Haitians from entering. And that, that, that's a human crisis. That, that is just untenable to me. How can we allow that on our border? And the Mexican government bears a lot of responsibility on that because they did not provide shelter, they did not provide food, they did not provide any support for those migrants. A, a couple of questions just came in. Um, at least I've noticed them. Uh, one, one has to pertain to what, have you given much thought to the question of U.S. Christian communities going into Mexico on mission trips? You know, particularly particularly during the, uh, the restrictionist policies that are in place today. Uh, mm -hmm. What's any thoughts on any of that? Yeah, let me tell you what I do. <laughs> I visit several shelters and before I go, I call. I say, what do you need? And you know, sometimes it's like we need cleaning supplies, the bathrooms, you know, what do we need to do to clean the bathrooms? We need laundry soap. 
sometimes I call and they say, you know, a lot of women are here. We need feminine products. We need bras. We need underwear. We need, you know, feminine articles because we have a lot of women. Sometimes they'll say, you know, we have a lot of children. Bring diapers, bring uh, bottles, bring formula, bring toys. Uh, we need to take care of the children. Other times I've called and they tell me, we just got the electricity bill and we need money to pay it. So sometimes we have to ask how we can better help. There are a lot of organizations that have you know, done different things. There, there's an organization in El Paso, the Frontera Women's Foundation. They partnered with a shelter. Uh, and these are young women that were kind of like, okay, we're staying here, we're not going anywhere. And they basically were paying their technical training school. Some of them were going to nursing school. Some of them were going to other medical professionals, like being a lab assistant or a pharmaceutical assistant. Some were going to beauty school. And this NGO was paying scholarships for them to go to school. So there are many ways to help. Sometimes, like my going there, I was bothering people because they don't have the time to deal with, you know, how, how can you volunteer, right? And so sometimes it's better to volunteer and help from a distance and in a different way than we are used to, uh, because that, that's, that's what's helping them. And sometimes they just don't want all these people and they certainly don't want uh, a lot of publicity. They really protect the migrants. Uh, La Casa del Migrante has an inordinate level of security. Why? Because some smugglers, some coyotes, some drug dealers have, you know, have threatened them. And so that is not a good thing. Okay. Let's finish with one other question. Um, and this mm -hmm. pertains to something that you said earlier. And this is the asylum question. And um, the, the, uh, the, uh, this person is asking the question, should the volume of asylum uh, requests be increased. Okay, so let me let me very briefly outline this. So you're an asylum seeker. You knock on the door of the United States, and you are then granted a credible fear interview. If the officer feels that yes, you have a case, then they let you in, and they can put you either in a detention facility until you have your day before an immigration judge, or if you have family, they then put a monitor on you and they basically find a partner, a non-governmental organization. In this case, I'll, I'll say one uh, Annunciation House. And that partner will then say, okay, my family is in Kentucky. My family is in Arkansas. My family is in Virginia they then find a way, whether it's an airline, whether it's a bus, and they get you on the bus and you go to your family and you wait. Now, those court dates can take anywhere from 365 days and up to 1300 days. So what happens while you are waiting for your hearing? Your children start going to school, you might have another child, you might find someone and fall in love and get married. It is a long time. So by the time you get to your hearing two, three years later, your life has changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, the, uh, the asylum, if you look at the track data at the Syracuse University website, you will see that very few people, about 14% of Guatemalans are being granted asylum and the rest are being, the denial rate is like 85% of all of the cases presented. So then you're told, you know what? No asylum, you have to go back. How do you go back? If you've been here, you now have US citizen children, your children are now in school. It's complicated. And so they become part of the undocumented people in this country, like, you know, 11 million of them. And so there has to be a better way mm -hmm. uh, of doing this. And that's why I go back to my point of do the uh, pre-interview, the credible fear interview, present your case in your country of origin at an American embassy or consulate, and then take it from there. Because at the end of the day, you can be uprooted. And so I just want for us to consider how we can ameliorate human suffering because that is untenable. Mm -hmm. It's just not appropriate for us to have all of these people suffering in this way.
And I think we need our policymakers to embrace that, mm -hmm. uh, that change and change their philosophy and take into account the feelings and the well-being of others mm -hmm. because they are our brothers and sisters, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ida Sema. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Reached the end of our, um, our our event here. And so again, I want to thank you um, for a insightful as well as stimulating um, presentation. And um, also want to thank the Luce Foundation for making this this possible. And I will try to get as much as I can on my on my website. There's some other questions about titles and essays and that sort of thing. And that website is flosada.com. So um, again, thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, look forward to uh, working with you again in the future. Be the hummingbird, everybody. There you go. Thank you. Thank you.